Welcome everyone. We will take a moment just to let uh, people enter and uh, then we'll get started very soon. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us today and on time. My name is Amber Bennett. I'm the Deputy Director of Reclimate. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a panel discussion on who are Albertans anyway. And uh, we, as the panel um, participants, are all uh, situated in, in Alberta. So this is a kind of a homegrown conversation. Um, over the next hour, we'll be looking into recent research and uh, really trying to draw connections um, to kind of what lies beneath the surface of some of the, the things that we see playing out in, in conversations in, in public and in politics and uh, try to understand what this means for communicators. Um, so I would encourage you to introduce yourself. I can see that some of you are doing that already. Um, so please use the chat uh, to introduce yourself. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I am uh, and honor the lands of the Blackfoot people, uh, the Sitsika, the Kainai, the Pakani nations, the Sutina, the Stony Nakoda nations, the Métis no nation um, that care and sustain my family and also um, are sustaining the work that we're, we're doing here today. Um, so again, while we wait for people to join, I encourage you to use the chat to introduce yourself and also to acknowledge uh, the place that you call home. Um, we have about 230 people registered for today's conversation. We may or may not see all of those people today, um, but as a package, we'll certainly send a recording, we'll send a summary of our conversation um, and any of the resources that have been shared. Um, we will cover quite a bit of ground. Um, we'll spend about 20 minutes or so uh, up front talking through and unpacking the, the research that our panelists um, are sharing. And then we have uh, some, some questions that, we'll, we'll, that have been sent in advance that we'll talk through, and then we'll have some time uh, for Q&A from the audience. So I can't imagine anyone here has not been on Zoom um, for a thousand hours over the last few years, but just in case, on the bottom of your screen, uh, the chat, um, you can see kind of those messages popping up right now. Uh, we'll be using that to share uh, research. Please introduce yourself. The Q&A is different. Um, it is uh, a few icons over We'd really like to keep and focus uh, questions for panelists. You can either focus them specifically um, or you can ask them generally and, and we'll tag them. So please use the Q&A. Um, we've asked our, our panelists to kind of pop in and uh, answer um, questions uh, that they, you know, that, that fit within their bailiwick. Um, I think that's it. So I, I think we should just jump in. Uh, I will be hosting and um, really the, the, you know, the context for this conversation is there are a number of big policies that are on the horizon for Canada. Um, you know, anyone who works in this space, there's an emissions cap, there's a clean fuel standard. Uh, there's the infamous Just Transition Act at this point in time. Uh, we have at least one election um, on the horizon in Alberta, possibly a federal election. Um, and really, you know, public opinion ought to uh, be informing how fast those policies move forward and uh, how effective um, they, they, they look in the end. Um, you know, I have been working in climate and energy in Alberta for probably a decade now. And I think it's fair to say that we get an outsized amount of interest in, in who Albertans are, um, both kind of from, from our Canadian colleagues, but also internationally. 
And so by extension, Albertans, not just Alberta, but Albertans, um, are often seen to be barriers in Canada for moving forward on some of these, these key climate policies. Um, some of the questions I think are really um, indicative of, of, the, of the questions that I get day to day. Um, you know, they, these were the questions that were sent in to us in advance. So what are the best ways to engage Albertans on the advantages of clean energy without alienating the oil and gas sector? Um, you know, what are Al Alberta values that connect to climate action? Um, you know, <laughs> any tips, RE, the just transition debacle? And uh, a personal favorite is why do they uh, vote for idiots and awful liars? So we'll, over the next hour, we'll do our best to, um, you know, to dig into that. Uh, I'm really happy to say we've got the good fortune of hearing from uh, three of the top researchers looking at and who have been thinking about who Albertans are and, and how uh, they position themselves to, to some of these topics. Um, our goal is to kind of move past, I would say, uh, the stereotypes that are often held, um, the, the kind of climate denial, big truck, anti-Ottawa uh, Albertan to really understand or better understand who we are um, and where we stand on climate and energy and what that means for communicators. So in terms of today's panel, uh, we have Janet Brown, uh, who probably needs little introduction and none of these panelists need much introduction in Alberta. Um, so Janet is one of Alberta's most recognized pollsters and political an analysts. Over the past 25 years, her work has examined, tracked and sought to understand what's really driving public opinion in Alberta. And over the past five years, she's also led several large scale public opinion research projects for CBC Alberta as part of the Road Ahead series. Um, we've also worked directly with, uh, with Janet over the past year uh, on some research, which we'll which she'll share. Um, there's much more to say about Janet, but I'll, I'll stop there. Um, our second panelist is Dr. Jared Wesley, who has also studied public opinion and political culture in Alberta for over two decades. And he's a professor of political science, science and a member of the Black Faculty Collective at the University of Alberta. He is the founding director of the Common Ground Initiative, a study of the unspoken norms and values underpinning um, politics in Western Canada and also Viewpoint Alberta, a survey uh, series tracking political attitudes. Um, he's held senior level positions in the government of Alberta and the government of Manitoba. So welcome, Jared. Thank you for joining. And finally, uh, Dr. Melanie Thomas, who is an associate professor of political science at the University of Calgary. Her research focuses on the causes and consequences of gender-based political inequality in Canada and other post-industrial democracies, with a particular focus on political attitudes, behavior, and policy feedback. Um, her, her, another piece of recent work explored public and elite opinion about the environment, the economy, and climate change. So welcome all, and thank you so much for uh, sharing your thoughts and spending time with us today. Um, so I think we have about 15 minutes to, to open this up, and really we're trying to set the context. I'd like to uh, hear a bit more about your research and to draw, draw you know, connections to what that means for people who are doing this work, communicators, you know, policy people. Um, maybe I'll start with you, Jared, first. In your Common Ground series and your recent survey work, um, which I think you're still crunching, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, you explored both the stereotypes of Albertans that they hold about themselves, but also the attitudes that they actually hold. So I'd like to turn it over to you to, to just kind of walk us through and say a bit more about who are Albertans uh, versus who we think we are. Great. Uh, well, thanks, Amber, and thanks uh, to the panelists for being here today. I'm, I'm coming to you from Treaty 6 territory. I recognize a lot of people in the chat, uh, some neighbors, some former neighbors, uh, when I was at the University of Manitoba. So um, great to be here to talk a little bit about what Common Ground um, does. I'm going to talk um, from the perspective of um, who Albertans are versus who Albertans think they are. So I'm going to start with the question that's been motivating our team for the last little while, um, who do Albertans think they are? And to do this, I'm gonna ask you in your mind's eye to do this little exercise that we do with our focus group participants. 
draw me an Alberta. Normally with our participants, I ask them to, you know, take a blank piece of paper with a marker and they'll do those drawings and I'll share some of those with you in a moment. But in your mind's eye, when I said Albertan, something sprang to mind. I want you to mentally record that. That Albertan could be holding something or standing next to something. They could be eating something or drinking something. And this is an activity that we do to launch all of our focus groups from Fort McMurray down to Hannah and all points in between. And what we found uh, is that most folks, regardless of where they're from, regardless of how old they are, regardless of what their, their background might be, what their politics are, they tend to draw folks that look like this. They tend to draw farmers, cowboys, and folks that work on the rigs. Those are typically um, white, middle-aged men. And we ask them as part of the exercise to name that Albertan, these are the types of names that come out most frequently. Joe is the modal response, but a lot of Johns, Ralphs, Al, Alberts, Richards, Toms, and so on. And, uh, you know, as we're running this, this study and, and taking it through peer review, we often get asked the question, well, how much are, are you actually capturing that's that's accurate versus uh, just, you know, possibly some sampling error. And, and one of the, my colleagues was sitting in the back of a presentation like this not too long ago and, and just burst out laughing in the middle of my presentation. And I asked him afterwards, what was he laughing at? He said, well, I ran your, your question, draw me an Albertan through an AI image generator. And these are the three top, top things that came out. Now, you know how AI image generation works. Um, they're taking everything that's out there in the internet. Um, in other words, you know, the, the most typical uh, images that appear when you hear the word Albertan, and this is what it comes up with. These are basically the same people that our focus group participants have been drawing. So Albertans have this view of themselves as a community, we argue, um, as being predominantly like Joe. I'm going to suggest to you that having that in mind, that, that vision of what a stereotypical or typical or quintessential Albertan is, actually affects our political attitudes and our political behavior. So as part of our Viewpoint Alberta survey series, we've started integrating some questions that pick at that and get the difference between who pe what people actually think, how they actually behave, and how they think the typical Albertan might behave. And here's what we found. I'm going to show you some results in a moment here that are still very raw. We have a sample that is just completing as I speak. Um, I'm giving you a snapshot of the first thousand or so respondents. So don't take the precise numbers uh, for what they are. We'll be releasing the exact peer reviewed version of it um, later, but I wanna show you some of the trends nonetheless. So we've looked at electorally, ideologically and policy wise, how actual Albertans feel versus how Albertans think the typical Albertan feels about these issues. So we asked um, a, a series of questions about the next upcoming provincial election. The blue dots here represent if an election were held tomorrow, which party's candidate would you support? And 36% uh, of respondents, as you can see there, said they would vote UC UCP, 44% said they would vote NDP. Don't start taking this out to the media and <laughs> and throwing parades if you're on the NDP side, and also don't cry in your cup if you're a UCP supporter. Um, but what I'm getting at with this particular graph is the difference between that, the vote intention, and the proportion of, of Albertans who expect the UCP to win, which is about 35%, and the percent that expect the NDP to win, which is actually below 40. There's a sizable gap between how people uh, would vote and how they think the election will actually turn out. I'll unpack that hopefully in the Q&A, but I just wanted to give you a sense of, of how that affects our election, our electoral, uh, uh, our, our perception of what's possible, what's likely in the electoral field, which can shape our attitudes and behavior. The second piece that we've been asking for a long time is place yourself on a left-right spectrum from zero meaning far left, 10 meaning far right, uh, and that usually shows up in our surveys as somewhere between 5.1 and 5.3, pretty well close to the center, just marginally to the right. For those of you that are into statistics, it's a, it's a normal distribution. Most people in Alberta cluster to the center as they do in, in all provinces across Canada. 
The follow-up question we asked, though, is interesting. We asked them, where would you place the typical Albertan on that same left-right scale? And consistently, over our last six surveys over the last three years, we found that the typical Albertan is positioned about one standard deviation to the right. In other words, the average is usually between 6.1 and 6.2. So Albertans themselves place themselves closer to the center than who they perceive to be the typical Albertan. There's a sizable gap here that some social scientists call false, false social reality. It's also reflected in our policy position. So this one's going to take me a little bit of time to explain. We'll start with the blue dots. The blue dots here represent the, the percentage of respondents who would support or strongly support the policy initiative that you see on the left. So the first dot at the top there, 19% of Albertans would support or strongly support the establishment of a PST. The green dot represents um, the, the average answer to the following question. We ask people, what percentage of the Alberta population do you think supports that policy position? So in this case, 11, on average, Albertans say about 11% of Albertans would support a PST, much lower than the actual self-placement. As we go down the list here, we find that support for the big fair deal policies like a police force, a pension plan, or a revenue agency are typically low, and they have been low for a number of times, about one in five Albertans would strongly or somewhat support those initiatives. But when they are, when asked whether they believe uh, that Albertans support those positions, actually people believe more Albertans than them support um, support the uh, support those initiatives. The biggest gaps are found here at the bottom. We ask people, um, are you in in support of government policies that would transition Alberta's economy away from oil and gas? Forty three percent of respondents either agreed or strongly agreed with that sentiment. But when asked what proportion of Albertans do you think is supportive of that transition, the number drops down to 29. There is a disjunction between who Albertans are, somewhat more supportive of, of transitioning the economy, and who they think the average Albertan is, which is much lower. Um, the last one here was whether to cut uh, public funding for private schools. And again, we see a huge disjunction or a gap there. So what does this mean? And we'll unpack this later in the discussion. This means, I believe, that Albertans are weighted down by social expectations. Political culture, as we define it, are the underlying values uh, and beliefs that structure politics in a given community like Alberta. They set the expectation for what's desirable, what's possible, what's feasible, and what's extreme. And to the extent that people don't believe some of these policy positions are possible, like a transition, because most people don't support it, they're not likely to stick their neck out with a sign, for example, or to support political parties that they think that they feel might be too extreme or too outside of that mainstream. So that's some of the research we've been doing here at Common Ground. Thank you, Jared. Super interesting. Um... All right, so we're going to uh, create some time for Janet and then Melanie, and then, as you said, we're, we'll get into a conversation and we'll start to weave some of these points together. So, Janet, I'd like to turn it over to you next. And um, as I mentioned, we have done some segmentation work with Janet over the past year, and uh, she's going to share a little bit more to help um, unpack this monolith of Albertans and uh, and say and, and and talk a little bit more about what that means. So, over to you, Janet. Um, Janet, you are on mute. Sorry about that. I'm going to try and share my screen like Jared did. Can you see my screen? We we can. Yes. Okay. Um, so so as Amber said, um, uh, we worked with with her and a and a, a group of um, a, a wide variety of, of uh, advocates. We can maybe provide that information um, in some of the follow up information. Um, but we did a big segmentation study. So we did a large sample. It was about 1,700 across Alberta. Um, I argued strongly we should do an oversample in Calgary, which we did because we always talk about battleground uh, Calgary. Um, and there's it's a rich database. It's a long questionnaire, lots of uh, questions about um, energy, the environment, um, social values, that sort of thing. Um, but we used this um, information to create a... Um, a segmentation. And we found that there were sort of five distinct um, segments. And they're sort of arranged 
you know, kind of from left to right on the screen for you. So what we found was that 21% of um, Albertans are what we call, you know, veteran activists. They tend to be sort of like older women. They, they're, um, uh, they're a little bit overrepresented in, in Edmonton. Um, you know, we tried to give each of these um, categories a funny nickname and we call it this group like the Storm the Barricades group. These are very left wing. They're very supportive of the NDP. You know, they're the ones who are going to come out and, and uh, fight for uh, progressive causes um, at, at any juncture. The next segment, by far the biggest segment at 41 percent, and you can see that, you know, in Edmonton, it's actually half the population. Um, we called it limited bandwidth. And, you know, these are... Um, you know, your typical Albertan, although I think we're gonna, as the conversation goes by, talk about how there's nothing really typical um, in Alberta, um, but this is the biggest uh, group. Um, attitudinally, they tend to be socially progressive, but economically conservative. But the reason I called the group limited bandwidth is because the main thing to know about this group is they're the hardest to reach, the hardest to access. They, it, it, it's, you know, they're, they're middle age, they're, they're at an age where they have uh, children, they're in their working years. So this is a group that's really accessible um, to both political parties. They're open, you know, there's a lot of them that are planning to vote for NDP, the NDP. Almost all of them are open to voting for the NDP. At the same time, the, the UCP is on their consideration list as well. The really tough thing with this group is they are so busy. They're just going to be the toughest group to get access to um, during the campaign. A small group, but we wouldn't have found this group unless we did the oversample in Calgary. We called it Calgary Dissonance. And although it's small, it's it's 18 percent in Calgary. And when the race is so tough in Calgary, um, this is a really critical group. And the name Calgary Dissonance, it's a play on cognitive dissonance. This is a group who very suburban, um, more than uh, more than average, uh, likely to work in the energy patch. Um, these are people who uh, on Jared's left right continuum would would pr probably put themselves a little bit more to the right, but at the same time, they care about the environment, they, they care about some social policies. We call this group dissonance because, you know, I like to think of this group as like, this is maybe somebody who works in oil and gas, they work for one of the pathways to net zero companies, they understand the importance of transitioning, um, you, you know, that they're concerned about uh, the environment, but they've historically been conservative voters. So this group is trying to work out their dissonance and figure out where they're going to vote. We have another group called the Red Tories. Um, the nickname I gave them is why can't we all just get along? Um, these are the people who comfortably voted progressive conservative because progressive conservatives help them resolve their dissonance in terms of, um, you know, feeling that they were somewhat progressive, but at the same time, uh, fiscally conservative. And then the final uh, group we've got here, um, we called them the the aggrieved and entrenched. This is the group that's you know really the maddest, the group that is is most loyal to the UCP. So anyway, that's how our segmentation um, falls out, and um, I can talk more about it as we go along. But my my main conclusions from all of this is um, when it comes to changing public opinion, it's important to remember. The most important people to reach are often the hardest people to reach. Um, and then the other big theme that came out of this research was dissonance. In this election, in a province where so many people, um, you know, see themselves as sort of leaning to the right, it's it's these people who are resolving their dissonance between a party that just a, a conservative party that is way outside of their comfort zone. But uh, when they look at the NDP, when they look at the NDP. This is a party that they've never really had on their consideration list. So that's what I mean by dissonance. So I, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Janet. Okay, so um, for you, Melanie, I know that uh, your research has looked at the, um, the politics of energy transition from fossil fuels to re renewables. You've taken uh, a deep dive on kind of where Albertans are at and, you know, where our Canadian peers are. And so I'm just curious, you know, even in the opening questions and the types of questions that we, we got, how different are Albertans from the rest of Canada or their Canadian counterparts? So not very. And to be, uh, I'll try to be brief about this. Uh, when specifically we're looking at attitudes towards energy transition, so we specifically ask a series of questions about moving 
uh, away from fossil fuels and a separate uh, towards renewables. So, you know, Maria in her in her work with um, the Alberta Narratives Project, there's this idea that um, more people are supportive of renewables precisely because they see it's, it's easy to see them as a nice addition to a core as opposed to becoming the core itself. And so we do see some variation across Canada in um, willingness to move away from fossil fuels versus a greater acceptance of renewables. So this isn't that's not that's not particularly um, special in the context of Alberta. There's still a majority that want to move away from fossil fuels. There's a super majority that want to accept renewables. Uh, and this is like, if we're going to see some differences between Alberta and elsewhere, um, it's a difference where I would call them variations on a theme. So anybody who had to do classical music as a kid knows that you got assigned a rondo or something like that, where like you had the the like the variations on the theme, but the theme always kept coming, coming back. And like the theme is the same from coast to coast to coast. Common themes. Um, the greatest points of resistance to energy transition is going to come from things like anti-Indigenous racism. So because it's existential to the definition of Canada, if the Canadian state actually started looking at Indigenous peoples properly and seriously, we would actually have to fundamentally change things like the Canadian Constitution. People get their backs up at that. Similarly, people who believe in things like Reaganomics, that's the best summary I can give it, um, the idea that business benefits when everybody makes a lot of money, including the poor, the idea that government should stay out of jobs, those people often have the largest points of resistance um, to energy transition, regardless of where they live. The Alberta specific one is this, well, it's not even Alberta specific, it's this idea that oil and gas will be the dominant industry until 2050. Like, the more the, sincerely these beliefs are held and the strongly they're held, the more likely people are to resist. Um, things that are different regionally. I want people to break this idea that province is doing all the heavy lifting, because when we look at some things like uh, we call them composition effects, as in where do people genuinely think differently and where do they live? Partisanship is one of the biggest ones. We're looking at federal partisanship. That's a feeling of closeness to the Conservative Party of Canada. It's not an Alberta thing. It's a boot. It's a boot where you get like a chunk of British Columbia with the Continental Divide through to Alberta, and then you capture Manitoba. Uh, Saskatchewan through Manitoba. So it's not just Alberta, it's a giant swath in the middle of the continent. And so thinking about it as just Alberta, the things that you see that are unique to Alberta that comes from rhetoric is because it gets mobilized in the provincial state. So it's not a regular person thing. And the things that are regular people things are things that you're going to find in a big swath of British Columbia, a big swath of Saskatchewan, a big swath of Manitoba, and probably ubiquitously throughout Ontario as well. So it's not Albertans being weird. It's because of other features in the system. Things that are unique to Alberta. We're more open um, to transitioning on some elements of renewables. If you look at where our electricity is generated, Alberta still has lots of coal-fired electricity. Um, in our work, we saw Albertans willing to like dump this faster than 2030. We don't see this in places like Quebec or British Columbia because they already have hydro. So they need to think about energy, like electrification transition, um, precisely because it's already done. Um, and that means that in some respects, Alberta's opinions, Albertans opinions about some of these things, particularly related to the expansion of renewables, reliability of renewables, um, like the economic feasibility of renewables, there's space for Alberta opinion to move precisely because we have a different starting point than other provinces. But that has to do with a structural thing. Like we don't have hydro Quebec. I don't think that's a, like Albertans are weird kind of thing. Um, the other thing that's unique to Alberta is uh, when we ask people where they think that their prosperity comes from, very few individual Albertans will tell us that they perceive that their ability to pay their bills comes from oil and gas. And they don't really perceive that Canada's prosperity comes from oil and gas as well, but they really think that provincial prosperity comes from oil and gas doing well. So I don't know how much of this is a stereotype. Um, but when you listen to the news and you hear the Calgary Chamber of Commerce saying small business is hurting, they should just not pay 2% um, on their profits because they're hurting in that sense. The question is, yeah, but where is the money going to come from them? And there's always this expectation that it's going to come from oil and gas because like we're immature. I will say this completely like bluntly, Albertans are politically immature because we don't like to talk about how we pay our collective bills inside the provincial state. We expect bitumen to do it for us. Uh, in the aughts, we expected gas to do it for us. And that perception is still there because no one is seriously talking about what do we do if we're not using that collective resource to fund the provincial state. 
Uh, and so in that sense, those are the th places where I would say Alberta is different. But when it comes to things like partisanship, belief in anthropogenic climate change, the effects are the same. The variation in levels, I think, are minor. And so don't let people deceive you into thinking that Albertans are a pack of weirdos, because they're not. And where they are a pack of weirdos, you're getting a chunk of British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario as well. Thank you. Okay, so key key headline coming out of today's discussion: Albertans are not weirdos. Um, we're we're very similar to other parts of the middle of the continent. Um, okay, so some of the things that came up in this conversation, I wanted to dig a little bit deeper. Um, you know, in the work that we've done, we've looked across a lot of research, and you consistently see high levels of support. Right, so we have seventy percent of Albertans believe in climate change. 75% are worried about extreme weather, 70% net zero. I mean, it just kind of goes on and on. Um, but I think each of you have mentioned this. What we don't see is this translating into public or political discourse. We're not seeing how um, the, the views um, and the levels of support that actually exist represented in uh, or translated into support for, for uh, transition policy or you know reflected in in political discourse. So I'm just curious, you know Melanie, you, you kind of started um, on this particular point, you know, from your perspective, um, how how much uh, how, how how shifting is are Albertans um, opinions on energy transition and on this topic? Um, and if you have anything to add on this kind of question around why is that not translating into um, public and uh, political discourse? So we have done a series of survey experiments where we tried to um, give people a piece of information and see how, um, if that changes how they feel about like specific energy policies, if it changes how they feel about energy transition, things along those lines. And what we were able to find specifically in Alberta is that um, presenting information about how much money you could make in solar, say, um, made people more open to the idea of solar. But we also, the negative story on this, when we wanted to do like a pro and con, the negative story that we presented was about a coal mining town that um, with the transition away from coal fired electricity, the, the small town was gonna die. Uh, I come from a small town that like, small grain farming town, <laughs> properly died because they tore up the railroad track when I was in high school. Uh, and so this idea of like small towns, like economic changes, killing small towns is something that you, you see across the province, right? Uh, to our surprise, hearing that information made people more supportive of moving away from uh, coal-fired electricity. And so in that sense, this is where we think, I think we need to bifurcate like which fossil fuel we're talking about and which one has the kind of like existential emotional connection it ain't coal and I think if you look at the metallurgic coal mining that was proposed um when you hear places like the town of Coleman saying tourism isn't replacing the jobs and the money that we used to be able to get from coal mining this is a way to get that back you have all these farmers saying I don't want selenium in my water that threatens the existence of my industry uh but also lots of people being kind of like hold no we don't want to go back to this like there's there's a big deep-seated public resistance to that why doesn't this translate into how our politicians talk about this then uh I think part of this is because when you have a period of one party dominance uh like we Alberta has uh basically until 2015 um the idea that who winning elections is somehow connected to sincerely talking to people like is just not there um I also think that if you do look at another level like in federal politics um one of the reasons why this doesn't happen is because places like Alberta don't pivot their votes and so there isn't an element of persuasion that's perceived by any political or partisan actor for that uh instead politicians can win um by leaning into the stereotypes and so there's a lot of these short-term calculations um that are often at direct odds with um what we would consider to be good representation and this idea of good representation there's any number of ways that you can conceive it but a useful way I think of thinking about it is that the people who are most affected by a policy feel like they know exactly what government's doing they know they can give information and see how the like there's an honest and sincere report back about how that information is being used uh, and this gets iterated in a really transparent kind of way uh, and then 
Um, ultimately, the people who are most affected are the ones that get to decide if the representation was good or not. And like, if you, it, I mean, you just need to remember a few years back to the kind of like, you're either wish on, with us or you're on Albertan like issues managers attacks to know that this norm of like good um, or like sincere engagement representation just kind of doesn't happen here. And so in that sense, when I see like, why would, so when I get journalist requests, like interview requests from the New York Times, say, the question will be, why is the Premier of Alberta saying something that's so colossally stupid? Honestly, I'm not kidding. That's what the question is. And it's like, because you're not the audience. The audience is the donors who they need to keep angry um, so that they keep donating and they keep volunteering because, and I've got an alum who's in the in, in the mix. So just kind of like, you know, like working in a political party is not fun. <laughs> no like this activity that people don't necessarily want to do so what do you need to do to keep people doing it and it's like finding a nerve and hitting it and hitting it and hitting it and hitting it and that's why that discourse is the prime stuff um rather than like what actually like reflects what people sincerely want and actually having that kind of thorny conversation about how we integrate that into policy i know i've gone on for a long time but the last thing i would say is this Remember Stéphane Dion in 2008? And I'm not saying that Stéphane Dion was the strongest leader, but when you only got one political actor who's prepared to engage in this kind of sincere conversation and like have to do the iteration of like, maybe I had it right, maybe I had it wrong. And like this sort of thing, all it takes in the other actors in the system to say uh, they're weak, that's not the way to do this. And it's politically catastrophic. So, okay. Thank you. Um, Janet, you think a lot about uh, where Albertans are in terms of, you know, their their political choices and, you know, on this issue. I'm just curious if you have anything to add or, or what you would say um, around this topic. Yeah, well, you know, so often the conversation about transition just becomes a binary discussion. You're either for it or against it. You're either for the environment or you're against the environment. And the dimension that Albertans care about that other Canadians don't give a lot of thought to is the timing and how quick it's going to happen. So you have a lot of Albertans who, I mean, I mean the stats show, we, the, the things you just talked about, um, Amber, that, um, you know, Albertans uh, value the environment. They think that transition is necessary. Um, you know, I've also got other studies that, that show that um, Albertans are kind of looking forward to it and think transition will be a, a boon to our economy, but it's the speed that's got people nervous, right? So, um, you know, when you say like, when you say net zero 2030, people go like, that's just seven years away, you know, and, and Albertans want to have a discussion about timing and they feel that the rest of the country just wants to put them in a bad stereotype and, and doesn't want to talk to them about it. Um, and I think we're going to talk maybe about the just transition a little bit later, but I'll say this is like, you know, just transition, it's, it's a buzzword. It's something that the, you know, uh, that environmental activists talk about all the time, but that language is, is really triggering for a lot of Albertans. And remember I talked about that group limited bandwidth, right? So think about those low information voters that don't know what it means, right? And I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and said, um, what does just transition mean? And um, well, just, <laughs> it, means, it means fair, it means like a transition that'll be fair. And then people say, because I think what the federal government is saying is, would you guys just transition already? Would you stop complaining and just transition? So just remember that that's how it's playing on the ears of like, I would estimate about 41% of Albertans. And Danielle Smith understands the confusion about what that term means. And if you've seen her recent video of her walking and talking outside of McDougal, she's trying to be Pierre Polyev with her videos, she's dropped the the. She doesn't call it the just transition anymore. She calls it just transition because for those 41% of, of low information voters, she gets them all worked up and she says, Ottawa just wants us to tr transition and they don't care the effect and they don't, they don't care the implications. Thank you. Yeah. Jared, do you have anything to add on to this point around, you know, that Janet and, and Melanie have, you know, I think part of the things that I'm hearing is both, you know, who are you talking to is important, 
um, you know, we kind of roll up these large, you know, sums into to levels of support, but it's really important to think about um, that there are segments underneath of it, that there are pockets of support, there are party members, et cetera. So, you know, as somebody who's thought a lot about, you know, the relationship of, um, you know, of, of, you know, kind of norms and, um, you know, political culture, you know, do you have anything to add on this topic of, you know, why, why is it that we might have support for these things, but it's not really translating into either the conversations we're having with each other, um, or certainly the, the conversations that our politicians are having. Yeah, so um, first it's, it's important to note that the politicians have all the polling data that we do. Some of them subscribe yeah. to Janet, they read all the stuff. So it's not as if they're disputing the public opinion data. I've talked with the folks that do their polling. They totally agree with, with, with where our assessment of where the public opinion is. I return back, I, I mentioned in, in my opening remarks about how this sense of who Alberta is affects us as individual citizens when it comes to voting and when it comes to our own policy positions and our behavior. It also affects policymakers. I'll give you one poignant example. So it was early in, the, I think it was the second wave of the pandemic. And sorry, Janet, you've heard this story before. Second wave of the pandemic. And um, then health minister Tyler Shandro was in a small community doing a town hall um, and somebody stood up and said, Minister, quite clearly you've seen the evidence on how mask mandates work. Other provinces have done it. The research is in. Why don't we have a province wide mask mandate? And Shandro's response to that was telling. He said, he actually acknowledged, he said, I've seen the data. I know what other provinces are doing. Tell me, how am I supposed to sell a province-wide mask mandate to the guy in Cold Lake? He used the phrase, it was live tweeted. We know he said, how am I supposed to sell it to the guy in Cold Lake? Well, who's the guy in Cold Lake? It's Joe, right? So I think it's it's a misconception here that, that, politi that politicians go based on public opinion alone. I think they go based on their own gut instinct, conscientiously or not. Like they may not be conscious that they're actually doing this, but they have in their mind this persona of the typical Albertan and that typical Albertan's beliefs uh, guide them as to what's feasible and what's possible. If you don't believe me, you talk about, um, you know, Ralph Klein and, um, uh, what was it? Martha and Henry and Jason Kenny would evoke Martha and Henry all the time. We know that that's who they think are the severely normal Albertans. Well, and if I'll just interject, don't forget that Alberta spent the last year just embroiled in a complete leadership controversy. We've elected a new premier. Um, you know, the, the politics has been about division in the UCP. And so there's this uh, perception out there that Alberta is very polarized right now. No. The UCP is very polarized. And, and so unfortunately, um, you know, the, the, the family feud um, in the UCP is, is what's driving our politics right now. And, you know, the... the Mel the, wants to jump in, but I got to jump on, on that point. Yeah, they've yeah. been distracted, but not distracted enough to establish rodeo as our provincial sport, which to Mel's point in the chat <laughs> is about trying to reinforce this, this vision of what Alberta is. There's a couple of things to point out. One of them is these aggrieved folks. Um, Janet, correct me if I'm wrong, but typically these are folks that wouldn't have voted. So these are people that the pandemic has brought in and now that they are, and they're weird, like the, the public opinion is very inconsistent and they're engaged and active in a way that they didn't used to be. And that brings in a degree of erraticness in it. Um, but I think part of this, I think, think about the animating feature behind the UCP. Um, like the NDP has got this long storied history, the PCs, it was more just kind of like we're the big tent party that like used to run the place. The animating feature behind the UCP was we want power because we don't want them to have it. It's a very us them kind of thing. And in that, like you can see it's a very different kind of leadership about the like be afraid of the other versus uh, I have a vision and I want to persuade you to come along with me even if you are not sure about this. And like Alberta is not in a position where we're having those conversations. It's very much a fear-based response of kind of like, what do I need to do to win? Because I'm afraid of not winning. And that 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 changes the rhetoric and the offerings that are given to the public about what kind of leadership that they're going to get. Um, and I'm not quite sure how much longer it's going to take for us to shift out of that um, and into something where we can actually like, 
I mean, Kim Campbell was right when she said that election campaigns are not the time to have discussions about policy. Um, but like the part of the problem with this infighting is that we're just not even having discussions about policy, period. Like the trivial stuff that we get is rodeo. Um, we're not actually having those kind of bigger ideas. And so to this point, it was my clap back to Chandra would be, um, what are you doing to convince Gary from Cold Lake? It's your job. You're in government, you see the evidence, you know exactly where we need to go. What, how are you doing that part of your job? And at this point, the context is that they've abdicated it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I just want to say to people who are on the on the um, webinar, please pop your questions into the Q&A. We've got about 15 minutes left or so. Um, we do want to hold uh, a bit of that time to ask specifically of the panelists what uh, what kind of key takeaways or recommendations that they would make to communicators right now. Um, I do want to come back to this point around the Just Transition Act. It's kind of the freshest. Uh, curious, throwing it out to the panelists, was that bad language um, or is there something fundamentally um, um, problematic with the legislation itself. So Janet, uh, if, if I can throw it over to you first, in, from your perspective, um, in, in how that played out, you know, what, what would you add or what would you say to that? Oh, you're on mute, Janet. I guess if your question is, is it like, is it bad policy or just bad communications? Um, you know, yeah. It, it's always bad communications, right? Um, you know, uh, whether it's good policy or bad policy, that's where the policy wants to decide. But, you know, the remember uh, um, this 41% of the, of the population that I call limited bandwidth, they didn't read the policy. They're not, you know, they're, what, what they're at odds with is they heard about it. They had this sort of visceral, visceral reaction and, and they're reacting emotionally to it. And, and as I said, I, like don't underestimate just what a big problem it was that people just don't understand what the term just transition means because um, the word just is, has got multiple meanings. So um, yeah. it's, it's always communications, yeah. Thank you. Melanie, what do you think? Um, I just kind of, I'm a cynic, I'll own to this and lean right into it. I look at stuff like this and I despair that it's just going to be another foil for partisan nonsense. Um, in part because I don't trust this current iteration of the federal government to actually do its house business properly. I think that's the explanation for things like um, tabling amendments to gun legislation and then having to pull them where, and like not being able to pass anything fast. It's just kind of like the house schedule is not being managed properly. Um, even the 2021 election when the only like campaign from the liberals was uh, pandemic and we're more popular than the other guy. And so in that sense, uh, I if I'm going to critique the Alberta government and Alberta political actors for not having the um, leadership to come up with a persuasion plan, neither do I think the current federal government has the skills or ability or the like inclination to do that either. And so if I were Daniel Smith, I would just hit the partisan nerve. And so in that sense, you can call, it doesn't matter if it's called just transition. It doesn't matter if it's called the Sustainable Jobs Act. On some level, it doesn't even matter the substantive content of the bill. It's just going to be the feds are out to screw us over again. And Jared can confirm this too, that political socialization runs strong. I got it as a kid on like the rural Alberta school bus. I have students being like, I don't understand why the federal government has it out for us. And it's like, they don't, but that's what you've been told. That's the stereotype, that's another one, and it's powerful. And that's um, what's gonna structure this, not a more substantial discussion. Thank you. Jared, um, curious if you have, or if, or maybe Janet, if you have done some polling around, you know, where Albertans stand on regulating um, regulation from, from Ottawa, you know, this kind of what's underneath of the Sovereignty Act, or, you know, to some degree, uh, you know, where do Albertans stand on regulating the oil and gas industry? Uh, well, we, um, it, it, I'm thinking about back to the big piece of research I did for CBC back in November. And, and we looked at some of the fair deal panel stuff in that. And Jared, you know, showed some of that stuff earlier in this presentation. Um, but one of the things we found is that, you know, Albertans really do support the idea of the provincial government pushing back on the federal government. Um, they really support the idea of Alberta finding ways to assert its, its independence and protect its industry and all of those things. So on a global level, 
Um, Western alienation is still alive and well. You just have to look at how Albertans voted in the last federal election. We are still very suspicious of Ottawa and we're still sort of looking for ways to protect our interests against evil, um, e evil Ottawa. But at the same time, the things that Danielle Spitz has been talking about, the Sovereignty Act, a provincial police force, um, uh, a provincial pension plan, these are not the solutions that Albertans want. So there, there's something going on right now, like Albertans, you know, we still, what was it, 61% of people voted in favor of Jason Kenney's um, referendum on, uh, you know, reopening the debate, uh, reopening the constitution on equalization. Like, you know, we're still alienated out here, but Danielle Smith is serving up these options that are just, um, that, that just don't make a lot of sense to the, to the average person. That's, I mean, that's, her political challenge right now. Thank you. Jared, I'll hand it over to you to add anything. Um, and then we'll we'll move over to kind of wrapping things up with some uh, key takeaways. I think, you know, I'm, I'm monitoring the, the Q&A here right now. And I think a lot of the questions that are here, um, we've touched on to some degree. So Jared, I'm just curious on this point of, uh, you know, that we've just mentioned around, you know, starting with it was it a bad policy or bad communications um, or where, you know, this kind of other point that surfaced on on where Albertans are at in terms of, um, you know, regulation from from Ottawa and how much they see, you know, Ottawa as, uh, you know, being evil. Um, any anything that's come up on your research around that? Or anything that you would add? Yeah, no, I just say this government seems very focused, or this provincial government seems very focused on naming of bills. So, you know, the feds can rename it the Sustainable Jobs Act or the Just Transition within, within a United Canada Act. I don't think it really matters. The substance, I think, is what policy people need to focus on. Um, in terms of how Albertans feel about the federal government, I mean, in broad strokes, they feel jilted. They feel misunderstood by Ottawa and the rest of Canada, but our research shows the more you delve into specific policy solutions, they're not in the mood for picking fights. They're in the mood for building bridges. So what are the most popular uh, solutions to Western alienation, according to our polling? More seats in the House of Commons for Alberta, more federal jobs out West, right? I mean, these are classic West wants in solutions. These aren't the West wants out. Mm -hmm. And I think that politicians are aware of that. And that's why they talk in broad strokes. And they only talk about the names of acts as opposed to going into the specific policies, because they know when it, when push comes to shove, Albertans don't want to sever ties with the rest of Canada. Thank you. Okay. Um, as the final stretch here on our hour, uh, there was a good question here from Jess Harris, and I'd like to wrap it up, you know, just in terms of our, what would you recommend? So Jess has said, um, do you have a sense of what types of energy transition messages, um, we could think about that in terms of frames, resonate most with Albertans or segments of Albertans? Uh, which arguments can be most persuasive? Um, uh, is it mostly about economy and jobs or fairness and health issues over others? So Melanie, I'll hand that to you and, uh, and, and then we'll move on. Yeah. Yeah, we spent a lot of time looking at um, the how pre people changing the messenger so changing the message and also changing the messenger uh and so i can tell you that um brett wilson doesn't do anything <laughs> we did look at mr wilson to see what some of his um overheated rhetoric uh suggested and it doesn't seem to do much but neither does somebody like mark kearney speaking as like former head of bank of canada head of the bank of england saying that the um uh the climate change and risk from climate change is something that um is a significant economic risk that like business needs to take into account. One of the things that, and this is where I think thinking about messaging, but how it also gets politically activated by political actors who are empowered by positions in the state matters. Because if remember the NDP government, the, the oil and gas actors that they would have on stage with them were the big multinational players. Like Grant Notley would have spun in his grave watching this because it's like foreign investment, Shell, um, Anything that's a multinational corporation. Remember when Andrew Shear and folks met with oil and gas in downtown Calgary and everybody looked at it and they're just kind of like, who? Because they're all just smaller local players. And so in that sense, I would expect that the political, the partisan actors will, will go to where they need to, to be able to secure where they think that they're going to win. Uh, but in terms of regular folks, like the thing that yeah. moves the most is um, 
look at how much money you can make in solar. Isn't that neat? And like, look at this small town because we're transitioning away from coal. Both drove support up for things like more renewables in like the electric, like in the electricity generation mix. I haven't found anything that drives support for transition down yet. We're still working on it, but okay. you know, it's not Brett Wilson. <laughs> Yeah. Um, over to you, Janet. So, uh, you know, kind of thinking about recommendations or key takeaways for people specifically, you know, what messaging and frames do you think average or particular segments of Albertans, um, you know, resonate with? Well, I'm, I'm going to get really political here. Um, you know, this next election, we're all trying to figure out what the ballot question is going to be. If the ballot question ends up being judgment and good government, then the NDP is going to win. If the if the ballot question ends up being, uh, you know, economy, um, then it, it then then that uh, economy just transition. Ottawa is not being fair with us. If that becomes the ballot question, then that's a better scenario for for Danielle Smith. So, like I would say, if you want to talk about these things, um, frame them from an economic point of view. When you start to talk about you know the 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 impact on the environment and stuff that can backfire on you because Albertans don't like to be accused of being anti-environment. And um, so if it seems that you're sort of like, you know, preaching to them or trying to shame them, um, you know, why are you driving that big truck? I'm driving that big truck because I've got big stuff to haul around. Don't bug me. Um, you know, focus on the um, focus on the economy, focus on diversification of the economy. Um, the reason that um, most Albertans, and keep in mind, it's a, the large majority of Albertans are embracing the idea of uh, transition and renewables and those sorts of things. They're embracing them because they think it's the answer to our economic modes. They, they think it's going to bring us the diversification um, that we need. Um, and, and I did some research a while ago and, you know, we talked to people about diversification and, um, there's there's diversifying away from energy and there's diversifying within energy and and I think if you sort of um, I think if you can talk to Albertans about diversifying with within energy and not make it as threatening as look look just get out of the energy business then 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 people will listen but when you um, when you make them defensive it's you know psychology 101 if 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 you make Albertans defensive they're not going to hear your message if you speak to what they're concerned about they will hear your message. Thank you. Okay, Jared, last word over to you. So kind of key takeaways, practical, how do, um, you know, things that communicators can keep in mind in communicating with average Albertans and specifically around, you know, uh, your perspective around messaging or, you know, particular framing that would work with particular segments. Yes. So um, I think it's kind of hardwired into folks that would consider themselves to be activists, that they need to place their um, their topic at the top of the public agenda, and it needs to be the number one issue, and they need to persuade everybody to be on their side. That is seldom ever accomplishable. Um, so I think a lot of folks um, in this space need to think about what is our ultimate, what's the ultimate outcome that we want to see? Do we want to see great public policy that's achieving this transition, whatever we want to call it, or do we want to be right? and publicly shame folks that are backwards. Now, if that's your goal, continue to fill your boots. If you want an accurate um, or a, a, a more responsive set of policies, some of these highly charged and politically sensitive issues, it means working behind the scenes, right? Um, the old adage when I worked in government was, you watch the throne speech and hope to hell that your particular set of issues didn't appear in the throne speech because you knew that the, the, the spotlight was going to be on them, they'd be highly politicized and turn into to partisan footballs. I, from a policy perspective, somebody who works on this kind of stuff, I'd love to see the transition work being done um, by smart people, honestly behind closed doors, to achieve the kind of compromises that don't require public climb downs or saving face that only get us into more political trouble. Now, I'm going to be accused of being an anti-Democrat for having this stuff happen behind closed doors. But again, what's the ultimate outcome that you're looking for? Okay, thank you so much. Melanie, uh, last 30 seconds to you. Uh, when you are building directly on what Jared just said, when you are building a public communication plan, think about everything that you have learned here 
and also think about how people are going to resist the things that you said and take that into account. 100%. Uh, I think ever, lots of the times when I'm dealing or talking with environmental organizations, it's more like, how can we just get people thinking on our side, as opposed to understanding that this is an iterative process that happens in context, and that's dynamic, and that it shifts. Um, also working behind closed doors, this is the last thing I'm going to say just to annoy the PR people. Um, Borgen, season one, episode two, PR context, cabinet negotiations, how you actually form the political executive that runs the show happens behind closed doors. So take your power as a voter, do as much as you want in public, try to work in the background and also understand that no matter what the context is, there are always these trade-offs and like build them into your strategy to work with them. Okay, thank you. Janet, any like 10 seconds, anything that you would add to that? Uh, you know, I just building off of something Jared said earlier about uh, our our relationship with with Ottawa. It looks like Albertans are just being uh, reticent and that we don't want to find solutions. But this is how just how our politics is playing out. Albert, the majority of Albertans, they're just looking for a better deal. They're not looking for a bigger fight. And uh, and I think if you can just keep that in mind, um, that that's that's the reality of Alberta. And to take the politics out of it, take the stereotype out of it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for all of you. Um, thank you everyone for your questions in the Q&A. We're going to take those questions and um, we'll we'll bring them back and we'll do our best to pull out the, the points that were mentioned here um, in the summary of the, of, of the discussion. So uh, just to say, we'll send a recording of this out. We'll send a summary of our conversation. We'll send um, uh, links to the resources that were shared. Uh, I also wanted to flag that we have another webinar coming up on February 23rd with Dr. Louise Como uh, talking about why wind energy projects fail. Um, I think that for anybody working on policy and comms, um, it's, a, it's a must attend. Uh, I also wanted to say that um, we are working uh, with the research that uh, we've done with Janet, as well as uh, with uh, looking at some of the work that um, Jared has done and uh, some other research that we have in the field. We'll be summarizing that and uh, publishing um, more on Alberta and Alberta opinions and uh, topics related to uh, climate and energy. Um, we'll also be hosting an in-person event um, where we'll be digging more into this um, for, for folks who are situated in Alberta. So more to come. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Um, and thank you to the panelists once again. Um, great discussion. Thank you. <laughs>